Hello, welcome back to Refractions. I am Stephen Mallon. Thank you so much for joining us. I am very excited that we have a rep with us. Uh, Marin Levinson is the founder of Red Eye Rep. So uh, Marin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is really awesome. So I guess I would like for you to tell the audience uh, your history with photography. Oh, wow. Um, well, you know, everything seems so accidental, all these little decisions that you make throughout life. Um, and then you look back on it and they kind of make a lot of sense, uh, if you're lucky. So my friends in high school will, rem will remind me that I was the photo editor of the yearbook, um, and things like that. But I, I don't, I actually really didn't remember that until, um, much further down my career. I really just followed vague inklings of things I liked which were words and pictures always and how they related to each other. Um, so I was an English and an art major in college. Um, and, you know, the natural end to that was magazines because that's where words and pictures lived together in harmony. Um, and so I, uh, in, in college, they happened to be making Double Take Magazine um, where I was at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke. And um, I really wanted to be a part of it. And so I tried to um, get myself in there somehow and they did not give me a position there. <laughs> so the world of photography is all about the nose, right? Um, so I ended up volunteering for the farm workers union in the same building so that I could be close by. <laughs> um, and that was actually a really uh, wonderful experience in and of itself. Um, and again, seemed really random, but I ended up at Mother Jones Magazine as my first job out of college. It was a paid internship. And, um, you know, that labor background was actually informed a little bit of, of the history of the magazine, um, which started with Mary Harris Jones. So um, again, all these things seemed really random and spastic, but uh, they formed a kind of accidental narrative. Um, and then after that, um, I worked at Mother Jones. Um, interestingly, I'm, I'm curating an art show with the creative director who was there at that time right now. So cut to 20 some odd years later. Um, and then I. Um, uh, a colleague of mine at Mother Jones was like, oh, there's this new magazine coming out. It's kind of like the Mother Jones of architecture and interiors. Um, and that was Dwell Magazine, which was a really rare and wonderful opportunity to bring um, a kind of journalistic and documentary voice to the world of architecture and design, which was its original concept was to kind of take an unstyled, unlit approach to architecture and design in the spaces we live in. Um, and the editor in chief of that magazine um, had worked with Tibor Coleman, who I was a big fan of. Colors Magazine was a big part of what got me excited about magazines in the first place. Um, and uh, uh, that was a wonderful experience, also. And, you know, some of all of these things seem so accidental, but I always tell people if you follow what you're interested in, your career will start to make sense. Um, so I uh, had done a documentary project in North Carolina on the Cat's Cradle. Uh, the creative director at Dwell uh, had been in a punk band that had played at that, <laughs> at that bar. I mean, just, you know, all these little coincidences that sort of helped push my career along. Um, and then I don't know how far you want me to go. Do you want me to go all the way to Red Eye? Why not? I, okay. I've got questions that we're gonna we're gonna okay. have to go to the cat's cradle for a minute, but <laughs> keep going. <laughs> I will tease it out uh, as quickly as I can, and then you can delve into what interests you. Um, and then, uh, you know, after dwell, I mean, there was no after dwell. I I really was thinking ultimately about moving overseas. It didn't happen for various reasons, and I thought, okay, I'm in San Francisco. I'm not in New York. There's really only wired and dwell uh, here right now. Um, what what am I going to do? And um, uh, I really started to work in everything in photography. I worked at a gallery for a little bit. I worked at a market research company. I worked at a branding company. I was really just trying. I knew I loved photography and I knew 
after being a photo editor for several years, I knew I I could tell the difference between good photography and not. And it took a long time, but I I was a good photo editor by the time I quit is what I tell everybody. Um, and then um, ultimately I was thinking I was going to open a gallery for international photography with my cousin. Um, and that was Red Eye. It was really supposed to uh, be a nod to international flights and the sort of accidents of red eye in photography. Um, and she has a great um, taste and business mind. And she thought a color in the name was good. She ended up opening a, a food truck um, and red eye turned into an agency. We, you know, we did some modeling about how many prints would we have to sell in a week to support two young women in San Francisco and it was like 9 million. And we just, <laughs> we couldn't figure it out financially. And at the same time, um, some of my favorite photographers from Dwell and Mother Jones, Noah Webb, Olivier Laud, they were asking me to help them. I'm going to New York. Who should I meet with there? Do you know any photo editors who would be interested in my work? And I was giving them this advice. And I think it was Olivier who said, you should be an agent. And I was like, oh, I'm not a salesperson. I, I don't want to do that. Nobody likes agents. That sounds terrible. But I didn't have a job. And I was starting to just do it out of my apartment while I was figuring out what I was going to do next. And it was really natural to me. And I, I found out that you know, it wasn't sales if I really believed in it. So to this day, I cannot take on somebody just because they're going to do well and make a lot of money. I have to believe in the work or I really can't talk about it in a convincing way. I'm not, I'm not a, a natural salesperson, but I am very naturally enthusiastic about what I love. I love that quote that you just said about it is not sales if you truly believe in it. Like, I think that that is such a great like lens and not to photo, you know, metaphor by accident, but just that approach when you're talking about something it you know i think it really helps change the frame about you know the communication aspect of it because i'm i don't like the idea of sales like it just it bothers me but it's like if you're talking about something that you just love and believe in it doesn't have that artificiality of commerce you yeah. know even even if it is but it's not it's not necessarily the goal it's just that you're you're just being passionate and engaged on that work I mean, I truly believe when somebody doesn't pick one of our artists that it's their loss. That that's really the that's really the perspective I'm coming from is like, oh, if you only knew how great they are, you know, your loss. <laughs> it's your loss. Um, and I don't think I'd be able to do it uh, otherwise. I, I, there are people who are very good at that and they do very well, but that's not me. And of course, the name of this game and any game is just uh, knowing what you're good at. So yeah, you, I just, we have to get into Chapel Hill and uh, Cat's Cradle a little bit and Duke University. Are you I, from there? I lived there. I lived in Chapel uh, Hill for six years, but like- Oh, no way. Yeah, pre, you know, in teen years, like I was there. Oh, I can't wow. remember who I saw. Um, it's a little hazy, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was there I mean, on Franklin I was Street. There. I was- <laughs> It was like, I have pictures with like Vic Chestnut in there and like the, uh, oh, I just, had, there were so many great bands that were playing then. Um, and it was such a fun, I mean, when you're doing a photography project um, that takes a long time, you also want to be really happy where you are. Um, and I, I assume you love being in industrial spaces. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, you can't put yourself in a position where you're going to be miserable. You have to be kind of, um, you know, eyes wide open, literally, and, um, enjoying yourself. And it was such a great place to make work. I love it. And Blind Spot was the genesis of the documentary program at Duke University, right? It was, it double was their take. magazine. Double take. Double take. Blind Spot was great too. Um, it was Double Take Magazine. I don't know which came first, if the Center for Documentary Studies came first or the magazine came first, but they were doing a lot of really cool things at the time. I think Alice Rose George was behind a lot of it. Alex Harris was behind a lot of it. Um, there were some great people. Margaret Sarder, his wife was my teacher. Um, there were great people who were in that photo community at that time. Um, yeah. 
And then you also mentioned Colors Magazine, which I have not thought about in a long time. But that was another like, just like beautiful, like photographically driven publication. It was one of the uh, first times that they really let pictures tell stories. I mean, Life Magazine, we talked about that a little bit before this call, but Life Magazine had photo essays that were very narrative, but um, Colors Magazine did it in a very unexpected, um, dramatic, poetic way. It was not as narrative telling a story. It was sort of these bold impressions that you walked away with. Um, it was great. It was, I, I still have them. Nice. Um, yeah, good days of nice 10 page spreads. <sighs> um, so moving into uh, Red Eye and assignment work and you have this amazing roster of talented photographers. Um, what is your like day-to-day -day like in general? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, do you do you have like, you know, I know we say it's, it's not sales when, you know, you're passionate, but like, how do, you, how do you structure your day typically? Well, I mean, Red Eye, now there's five of us. Um, so there's uh, everybody who's working. We have a very big and strong uh, styling arm, um, photography, video. So everybody's working on different projects. It's a little different now post pandemic because we spend a lot of time on uh, company wide Zoom calls for both styling and um, uh, all company calls. So I would say about two to three times a week, we have these hour, hour and a half long calls where we're uh, telling each other what we're working on and, um, and you know, identifying artists that might need a little extra push in terms of outreach and uh, getting started on ideas for that. Um, I would say it breaks down into like, uh, two or three basic arms. One is jobs in production, right? So the first priority is if you get an email about a job or a call about a job, that's your top priority. You, you know, we're seeing that through. We're answering it immediately, hopefully, and um, giving the client what they need. So generally, I have long term projects, but I these short term production things, I drop everything to work on a job at hand. So then the long term thing, well, we. We do outreach for certain artists. We also are making meetings. So um, one of our agents, Tiffany, is going to New York next week, um, and she's been reaching out to you know every ad agency, every creative director, designer that we want to meet with there because we still show physical books. And maybe that's a function of my age, um, but we have found during the pandemic that people loved seeing our physical books. Um, for me, I always knew it was the difference between somebody who could appear good and somebody who's really good because <laughs> it takes a lot to put together a book, to edit it nicely and produce it nicely. It's like another level of proving who you are as a visual artist. Um, I'm really proud of all of our <clears throat> books. And what happened, like I would say around 2021, 2022, we were one of the first agencies back out there doing meetings and people were like, oh my God, seeing physical books. Uh, this is so great. I'm behind a computer all day. It's so nice to just sit with this work and it brings up conversations that wouldn't come up just glancing over a website. It's just another medium to experience the work and have conversations about the work. So uh, I'm a huge proponent of that. I don't know, talk to me in five years, but I, I'm still holding on tight to these physical printed books. I think they're so beautiful. Um, and it's just a, a slower pace of looking at something um, and um, and absorbing it. Um, so we're updating those books. We're so there's a lot of marketing um, upkeep. Uh, photographers are sending us their online portfolios, their newsletter edits. We're constantly Red Eye is a creative agency, so we really like to be involved in people's branding. Um, and our artist branding. And, you know, I always tell people, everybody who's in this business got into it because they love photography and, and film uh, and styling. Um, and these are visual people. So you have to excite them on their level. Um, and so our websites, it really matters how they're designed, I think. Because if an art director or designer is looking at your website and it's poorly designed, it would be like showing an essay to an editor or copy editor where you had bad grammar or stuff misspelled, unless it was on purpose, of course. Um, so 
just understanding your audience and and what they respond to and delivering your work in a way that they're ready to consume it and enjoy it um, is, I think, one of the most important parts of the business. You only have a chance once to make a first impression. So there are some artists that we've agreed to take on, but we have not announced them until they've redesigned their site. Um, and we won't do it because at the second, you, you know, I always say you're only as good as the least good picture on your, in your portfolio. So the second, so, it, you know, you have people there and they're like, oh, they're good. They're good. They can't make a bad picture. They can't make a bad picture. Oh, that's oh. cheesy. Oh, maybe they're cheesy. Do you think they're cheesy? We can't send them on this thing where we have all this money riding on it. If there's a chance they could make a picture like that and think it's okay. So it, it's a psychology of, especially in photo editing back in the day, people weren't on set with you. They were just sending you off and trusting that you understood their vision. In advertising, often there's art directors there and there's you know clients there and a lot of people there to make sure you don't mess up. But with photo editing, there really wasn't. Um, so we think it's so important that, that every single picture, the typography, all of that stuff it is pretty dialed in before we send it out into the universe. So there's a lot of creative feedback. Um, and then there's strategy, you know, often, um, you know, the agents at Red Eye have definitely made it better over the years and have told me when we have to do things differently, when our social media needs to be different, when, you know, we ultimately had to stop uh, doing editorial, which broke my heart because that's my background. But it, it wasn't fruitful. No photo editor wanted to talk to us. And any money that we would be taking from a shoot would be just money taken away from the quality of the shoot and, and you know, the production of it. So it just got to the point where it, where it didn't make sense. And so we're solely doing commercial work now, even though we encourage our artists to do editorial whenever they can. So that's I think that's really good to hear, actually, because that that is exactly what the situation is, right? Like the the amount of money that photographers are getting paid on editorial is, you know, is still to this day, you know, pretty minimal. Like it's less than what an assistant essentially is getting paid on commercial jobs. Exactly. So it's really good promotion, but that's what it is. And then, you know, it's kind of counterproductive for the agent to be taking a commission on that because it's really there yeah. to help sell the next big job. And it also just the, the timelines are so short in editorial that having another person it's just like a game of telephone like it, it just stops the efficiency of getting the job done a photo editor wants to call you up you know at 10 o'clock the night before and be like hey can we pull this off can you drive to vegas tomorrow you know hat, writing to an agent who may or may not get back to them immediately and then having to reach the artist it's just too much of a middleman um so but you know what you said about um i never thought about it as them making less than a system but it's true um it's kind of crazy, actually, to think about. Um, but yeah, I mean, now we just had to change our perspective. And obviously, that happens with every sort of seismic shift in the industry is changing your perspective. Um, if you are sort of beating your head against a wall, trying to hang on to old ways, it's never going to work out. I mean, we're in an industry that is based on technologies. It is going to be affected by technologies. Um, and we have to accept that. I mean, I, I remember when digital photography came, people were like, oh, no, nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to use film. Nobody's going to take a picture again. But, you know, the people that had a voice and a vision and were creative shifted and found their way. And there are some people that still ask for analog work every now and then. But, like, um, you know, we we're we have to be evolving all the time in order to stay in this, in this business. And with editorial, we just said, okay, this is paid portfolio work. Now, this is really fun. It reminds our artists why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, they get great connections, subjects. Um, and you know, it's, it's almost like a paid test or paid portfolio work. Exactly. I think that that's, and that's why photographers need to be doing it. It's like not, thinking about the money, but thinking about the story and thinking about the, just the visibility of, of it. Yeah. Um, oh, shoot. You just said something I wanted to follow up on. I lost it. Um, it'll come back. <laughs> it's a shame because it, it really is such great work and such great people involved in editorial. Um, you know, we always had a ball working with all the photo editors out there. 
I, I, you mentioned uh, analog and about people requesting it. Do you sometimes get clients requesting saying we want you to shoot this on film? I, I would, to be fair, I would say it's usually an art director who has a cool vision who's like, oh, you shoot some analog along with it. People who want a different texture, like um, a lot of kind of more like music media clients that might want that that granular texture or um it, it has to be somebody who has a real style that they're looking. It's a choice. It's never a default. It's an artistic choice if somebody asks for it. Okay. So if the art director has a film crush, essentially, yes. I think I just, exactly. I really need some Velvia on this. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I need that color. Um, I'm always shocked, but I love it when I hear it. How, you're, you're you know, you're a rep for, commercial work how um what would you say the split is between like um the entertainment industry as far as like the uh film and music studios coming to you versus the ad agencies and what are the differences with dealing with those three categories of clients i don't know if i'm oversimplifying it or not but well there are different categories of clients red eye as an agency is not a sort of, even though we're in LA, we're not a celebrity agency per se. We have people that do great celebrity work. Michelle Watch, John Keeley, Chris Buck, beautiful celebrity yeah. work. Um, but um, I wouldn't say we specialize in key art um, in general as an agency. We're kind of, I always tell people we're sort of like an, a mixtape kind of agency. We have like a different artist who's really good at what they do. They're all very voice driven, but there isn't, you know, there are some agencies that are entertainment based. There are some agencies that are lifestyle, fashion. I, I like to think we have like one of everything, you know, of who they are. Um, the I would say our client breakdown is really between ad agency. Yes, some um, studio uh some studios and then also direct to client. So I think the big shift over the last five to seven years has been that it is more direct to client and less ad agency than it was. Um, a lot of people are bringing production in house. Um, a lot of people are, you know, sort of trying to cut out that step of having uh, the high costs of ad agencies. We often miss the ad agencies um, because they do a lot of the work that ends up falling on us. Um, but, uh, you know, it's again, it's just adaptability and, and the way of the world. Um, so producers are getting leaned on a lot more because, um, you know, they're sort of turning into the ad agency. And then us as an agency get leaned on more on those jobs where we're kind of, getting client approvals and sort of telling them what it means to do a photo shoot and what the expectations are and how it works. Traditionally, an ad agency would do that with their client before they came to us. So the full-time, so the, the clients are bringing in like full-time designers and then coming to you for a production. And there's a lot of, is that what full -time you're saying? designers and full-time producers. And full-time producers, okay. some do it great and it's so much fun um because there there's a, a lot less of an approvals process so you know we are very efficient and very creative and um you know there's this thing that happens where ad agencies you know they they have to risk biting the hand that feeds them so if their client they're, they're very scared of losing their client rightfully so. Um, we need every client we have, right? Um, but because of that, um, sometimes they're afraid to take bigger chances or to push back on a client. The, the, the days of Mad Men where there's a very creative art director telling the client what to do um, are over with a, with a drink in his hand at three o'clock. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that that people are are um, are, are pretty tentative about pushing their clients too hard because they they don't want to lose their clients. So sometimes direct to um, corporate is is much more creative because they are the client. They if they want to take a risk, it's on them, and they're not going to blame anybody but themselves. Yeah, I've, I've noticed there's been a bunch of full time jobs 
popping up, you know, like in-house shooter, you know, positions opening up at different uh, clients. And there's been a couple of us. It's like, this would actually be a lot of fun to like be. Full -time I, mean, I, I think in-house shooting is actually uh, the wave of the future in some ways. I mean, I, I, I have a niece who's at Parsons and I was so excited. I think I told you that, you know, nobody else in my family really is in this creative sort of sector um, doing this type of work. And I was like, oh, I can actually like help somebody in my family. I'm going to get her a job. This will be easy. I've been in the industry for 20 years, slam dunk. <laughs> um, and it was really hard. And I was talking to some really seasoned uh, photo editors and I was like, well, what's going on? Like, how do people get started in the industry these days? Um, but they're not really assigning much because they all have these in-house photographers who do most of the department work. So it, it used to be in magazines, there was front of book, there was back of book, there was images for table of contents, there were images everywhere and you needed to hire somebody to make them. Now I think they're saving just big features and covers. Their whole budget goes to a couple select big features and covers and everything else is shot by in-house people. But I've seen a lot of these in-house people go on to do great, great things, both in-house at ad agencies and in-house in, in magazines. So I feel like Bobby Doherty, there are like people, Justin Bettman, that were all sort of in-house at different places and have gone on to have really strong commercial careers. They have all these connections. They worked with all these people there. So I, that I, I am finding now that that is what I would tell a really young photographer graduating to try and get is an in-house position where they have access to um, a studio, they can make their own personal work on, you know, off hours, they are um, connecting with a community of art directors and um, producers. Um, I feel like that's what I would do if I were graduating and good enough. You have to be good. <laughs> that's the other, right? You've got also need to be like, have the, you know, momentum and visual skills to get in. Yeah. And be at a full time place because it, it's hard enough getting like one editorial with these magazines, but imagine you're like, now getting them to hire you all the time. Yeah. It's a good climate actually for um, experienced photographers in, in editorial right now. Um, uh, I think it's a harder climate for people just breaking out because there's just so many, the volume is so less. There's just so many less opportunities. I mean, it, we used to assign 20 things. I think they're assigning one to three things now per issue. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite a drop. Yeah. And, you, and like you said, one of those shoots is the cover. And I would say 90% of that is a, you know, celebrity or famous portrait. And mm -hmm. then the other 10% is illustration. Yeah. You know, is, you know, or giant group show shot with Annie or somebody that. Yeah. Um, or your photographer, Chris Buck, who's done a lot of amazing. And, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, if you have three features and you could hire Chris Buck or Annie Leibovitz, then you would. Right. Like, why, why not? Like, you know, they're going to do a great job. Um, there's not much of a risk there. Um, so, you know, I, I've been excited to see a bunch of the time covers that our artists have been doing have been really interesting. Um, but there aren't that many outlets for um, the younger photographers who are making interesting work. Sometimes. Um. You had mentioned also earlier just about adapt adapting to the technology and marketing. What are some ways that photographers need to be getting the work out now? I mean, we've got Instagram, we've got, you know, all the social media platforms. Like, are you... Oh, I lost huh? your video for a second. I guess I'm listening. Marin's on a talk, so we're all just listening in. Oops. What was that? <laughs> I think it might be, is Red Eye on here? Maybe you guys can pause that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining. <laughs> um, so the question, I guess the question was about marketing for photographers that are not, that don't have the advantage of having an amazing agent like, you know, Red Eye to promote them. What are some things, you know, they need their presence on the social media. Um, should they be doing like the behind the scenes shoots on TikTok? Is that like getting the attention? I love seeing it, but is that influencing like 
hiring decisions. Like I had a client kick me back at one point because I didn't have, you know, like 10,000 followers on Instagram. And that was like one of their, you know, um, you know, baselines. it was just baselines. It was just yeah. one of their decisions. Like you've got to have at least, you know, this many people on social. For we us have to that too. I mean, I, I understand it from a media perspective. It's like, okay, if you can tell your client that by working with this artist, they're going to get 20,000 more viewers. That, that is a selling point. Um, you know, there will be things, there will be a million reasons not to hire us <laughs> all, all throughout. I, I don't, I, my, I guess my point is if you are naturally having a good time doing TikTok videos and you have something to say, do it. You never know. It could be viral. Um, it is tricky to try and do something just for the sake of, you know, selling. It's a kind of wag the dog situation. And I think that especially visual people just see through it so quickly. Like, oh, that person is doing this to try and be visible in the marketplace versus just having something creative and interesting to say. Um, so yes, if you like doing this type of thing, do it. It's great, you know? And I always say it takes like three different things in, in marketing to get somebody to hire you. They had a meeting with us, they saw your work in a magazine, and they met with you two years ago, and your latest Instagram post made them smile. Like, you know, it, it's never, so you kind of have to do all the things. You have to maintain a good website, you have to have a presence in social media. And then if you do something really interesting, fun and cool, that's going to be awesome too. But you can't do it for the sake of that, because people will be able to sniff it out. It just will feel not authentic. Um, and, you know, even though it's an image making world, um, authenticity is really, um, something that people can sniff out pretty easily if it's fake or not. I mean, I think that's why reality shows were so popular because it was like, oh my gosh, this is real. This is really happening. This is crazy. You know, and, and that speaks to people, um, so, I mean, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I am close to 50, but I would say that, I mean, anytime you're making content that's interesting, it is going to help you. Anytime you are making content that is a filler and clearly just for the sake of getting a wider audience is going to hurt you. That's so, you know, if you want to, if you want to dabble in AI, do it, but don't do it without something to say. Don't do That'd it for the sake of doing it. Really uh, good advice. Yeah, it makes sense to me at least. Yeah, you know, so experiment, have fun with it. See if see if that medium helps you say something in a different way um, or reach people in a different way. But if it doesn't and it's redundant, then it's not adding to the situation. What are your thoughts on on AI and <laughs> rights and the, like? Are you are you is there a line item in the in the usage contract that's saying like you know hands off of chat gpt or whatever whatever the image you know so we have a paragraph that we've added to our terms in you know the last year that basically says we do not permit this do i have faith that that is really going to do its job i don't know but you know, if there is a situation where it comes up and we can really trace one of our images there, if it's in the contract, then at least we have a leg to stand on. Yeah. So I guess my advice to everybody would be to put that paragraph in there to either speak to a lawyer or um, look up something online that gives you some verbiage that you can throw onto your invoices or estimates that says, I'm not giving you permission to do this. I'm not giving anybody permission to do this. I'm giving this company permission to use the images in this way. Um, that is the best we can do. I mean, it's the wild west. I really don't know where this is going. I mean, I've been looking for an AI artist or somebody who's doing something interesting with AI and I haven't been totally moved yet, but I am sure that will change. Um, I've seen some really cool stuff that Charlie Engman's been doing. I'm not sure that ad agencies are gonna be, you know, jumping on 
the, the bandwagon for some of the weird and wonderful things that he's been doing. I'm sure there's a lot out there that I just haven't discovered yet. Um, and I'm excited by it. I mean, you know, the medium isn't really important to me. I, I love images that move me. It could be painting, photography, video, um, anything that makes you see the world differently or, um, or, or moves you. And so be it AI, CGI, analog, um, it doesn't matter if it's done well to me. It's a tool. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of other people that would say different things, but that's my personal opinion. I mean, it's the argument's been going, it's been ongoing, you know, since the moment roll film was introduced, you know, the, the original photographer is like, this is the death of photography. Right. And then, you know, digital was the death of photography. And then the camera, you know, phone was the death of photography. So, I mean, the, the reason I actually think all of those things have furthered photography. I mean, there are more photographers than ever before. <laughs> there's so every job we bid for, there's 30 other people that could probably do it very well. Um, I'd like to think not as well as us, but there are, it's a very competitive field. And why is that? Because images are everywhere. We're consuming images all the time. Really cool images are everywhere. Um, and, you know, thanks to the ad agencies and the companies that are spending money on it. So I've, you know, ever since Instagram came out, I have been sort of preaching from my soapbox that you have to have a perspective and a voice that is very, very strong or else you will get lost. I mean, I when I started in photography, we needed stock pictures to fill quarter page thumbnail sections of magazines. We needed an image to put in there. Nobody needs an image anymore. Anybody can take an image, borrow an image, Google image an image. There's, there's no need for simply an image. But what they need is a voice and a perspective. The, the way that you make a living as a photographer is, is this something that only you could do and no one else could do? And for those people, there will be work. But for everybody else, so that when people are like, oh, I, all my stuff is, you know, um, in landscape, should I do more studio work? Or all my stuff's in studio, should I do more landscape work? Or I don't have enough people, or I have too many people. And I'm just like, you know, you will disappear if you try to please everybody. You have to, you know, just figure out what you is and put that hard into the universe over and over again, and then you will be a destination. You won't be hustling for every job. People will be coming to you. That's the dream. And that and that supersedes all the technologies and new fads out there. It's just being an artist. I mean, I actually think that photography has been elevated in that way because um, it's not just a, a, a medium. It's like the, the people that are successful in photography now are, are artists with a vision. Um, and there, it used to be that it was like, oh, are you an artist or a photographer? Um, but now good photographers, photographers that make it are all artists. I mean, everybody on our roster, I think is a, a very accomplished artist. I don't think of them as just somebody who's figured out the technology of using a camera. They're somebody who has a really strong voice. Yes. You mentioned uh, the, the bidding aspect of this and the triple bid and everything has that gotten worse or more complex in yes. the past like yes <laughs> <laughs> what's changed yes um <laughs> treatments treatments have changed so i fi it finally came to me this year i couldn't figure out why all of a sudden everybody was asking for treatments they, it's like before they could breathe they were asking for treatment and i was like you know it used to be they looked at your portfolio or they looked at your website and they knew if they wanted to bid with you or not and I think that uh, because film and video have been merging, mm -hmm. um, film and video productions are merging, th there's not as much money to do two different productions. Uh, so have the art directors. And uh, motion art directors, uh, that is a part of their vetting process is um, treatments. They, they see a treatment for everything. Um, motion production companies see treatments. So because it's part of 
that industry as a very like normal thing as part of that industry, um, it's become so with photography, which tends to be kind of tacked on to video shoots um, at, at this point with the bigger brands. So what? how does that make it harder? It makes it harder because for all of our artists who are perfectionists and visual and very good at what they do, um, there is no such thing as not spending three days toiling over a treatment. You can't, you know, often people say, oh, just a mini treatment, just a small treatment, just a little <laughs> treatment. That does not exist. You are pulling all of these images, you're writing words, which some of our artists really don't like to do. Um, you are basically an art director. You're putting together a treatment. Now in motion, there are treatment writers who do all of that for you. Oh. And that is part of the, what the production company offers. So the artists aren't paying for it. But in still photography, they're either putting it together themselves or they're paying a couple thousand dollars to have somebody do it who may or may not do it as well as you do it. So for every job that we get a treatment asked of us, it is either a couple thousand dollars out of pocket for a job we might not get or it's three days of your life when you might have other things that you're doing. So most of our artists do their own because they are visual people. But I, I think that's what makes the bidding process harder now because um, it's not, it used to be that an agent would just put together an estimate. There'd be a great phone call. You'd call it a day. Um, it wasn't as much of an onus on the artist, but now it, it's really like a week long commitment. Um, every job we bid on big jobs. And this, the treatment is coming in before the estimate. Are they looking to see like the visual? You like, delivered you, at the same time. It is the same time. Okay. So we're interested in getting you for this campaign for, you know, X, Y, and Z brand. And so are they giving you like a framework saying we want to shoot in Spain? We're thinking about, you know, shooting golf balls and Maseratis. Send me what your idea is. Or are they, how much, how much are they outsourcing the you know, the narrative and the treatment back to you and back to the photographer? Um, obviously, creative is different for every job. Um, you know, we really appreciate it when they've thought about it. And we also really appreciate it when there's creative freedom. So that's different on every job. A shot list is always helpful before we start estimating, but sometimes we don't have that luxury. Um, uh, usually there's a conference call. Um, it's another area that you can fail, right? Because <laughs> it's sort of like what I was saying about a book. And a treatment too. These are all places where you could not be the strongest one. So we've gone into jobs where they've said, you are our choice. You're our top choice. Ah, the client just asked us to do a triple bid. It's just a technicality. And, you know, we there have been some jobs where we've lost it over that. And there have been other jobs where we know that we had it before it happened. And we feel terrible for the other artists who are spending a week of their lives, you know, proofing making their treatments perfect, knowing that we shot the campaign last year, they already told us we're going to shoot it this year, but they still put everybody through that process. I feel bad for the art producers who are going back and forth on budgets with three people. Um, but it's just become the norm. I mean, it must be something I don't understand. I, it must be like clients want to know that they're getting the best deal. So they want to see three different presentations. Yeah. You just, you need three quotes on the, you know, we're the contractors, you know, right. it's like, just want to make sure that even if, you know, even if it's the most expensive one, not the cheapest, they just want to know that you did the groundwork, you looked, right. here were the options. And, yep. you know, there is somebody that will do it for half, but look, yeah, you know. <laughs> and I guess that's where the treatment and the phone call come in, right? But look, look how different it is. Um, but it is an area where we can, let's say the artist is on another shoot and doesn't have a lot of time and they kind of phone it in. Um, we've lost jobs that way where we kind of, we, we, uh, accepted the truth that it was just a little mini treatment and just a technicality. And they're like, well, the client saw this other treatment that was 40 pages long and they seemed to really like, you know, the project more and they showed so much more effort and then we didn't get it. So but you told me we were never going to get right. it. <laughs> so yeah, but I, you might have. <laughs> I always, I now, I, I believed it for a time. And I now tell all of our artists, there's no such thing as a mini treatment. You're either going to do it or you're not. You're, you know, you can do a mini treatment, but we're probably not going to get the job. And when you, you just said 40 pages. 
I, it, I'm it, exaggerating. Okay. <laughs> uh, but not by a lot. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, if you have one image a page, uh, it can get long fast. Um, you know, usually there's a section for applicable work, styling, casting, lighting, production team. Um, they're, they're pretty hefty. Um, and they put a lot of time and energy into them. It's so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of the energy. I think it's the thing that like you can get really excited about putting together this beautiful, you know, here's how I want to shoot it. These are the, you know, these are the locations. These are the shots that I've got in mind. You know, this is the, what I'm, <clears throat> the, what I'm hoping to do with this and everything. And that part about it is great. But it's heartbreaking when 80% of those potentially don't come through. If you're doing this on every single bid, um, it's got a, it's a lot of energy and it can be it draining is, and it can be frustrating. Reasons, it's one of the reasons we love uh, repeat clients because repeat clients, if we've done that process once, once with them, they won't have us do it again sometimes. And that's really nice because that we know that we trust each other. They, we know that... Um, they don't have to kind of uh, reinvent the wheel every time. But, you know, I, I accept that it's part of the way things are now. And, you know, the artists that put together a really nice treatment do really well. Sometimes we put together great treatments and we don't get the job. And, you know, that happens too. Yeah. It's, you know, but it's practice. You, you know, you keep refining the, you know, the presentation. You keep tweaking it. Like, you notice, like, just... I've got it. I've got an InDesign document for these for these decks that I put together, and I keep on just like swapping out a couple of photographs, adding, changing yeah. the sequence. You know, yeah. like I'm pulling this, pushing this. Um, it's nice if you have like a nicely designed template that you can update and change for each one. Yeah, I don't know if it's nicely designed, but it's in InDesign. <laughs> 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 don't let me get my hands on it. I'll. I'll. I'm famous for sending people back for revisions. Oh, I, I would be honored. I would be very happy for you to tear this thing apart. <laughs> um, very good, picky. Nice. How often are clients coming? And maybe this gets back to the um, to the brief on it, but um, are they asking uh, for work on spec? Are they asking, can you just like go out and shoot a quick, you know, piece of this so it can bring it back to the client? We're not going to use it. I just need it for the layout or, you know. Sometimes, well, it's changed a little because again, most art directors are actually pretty good photographers with their iPhones. So if they need to put a deck together, they usually can get what they need. There's no need for an image. We used to do a lot of kind of FPO licensing, um, uh, but that's not really a thing that much anymore. Um, there are spec sheets that happen a lot and we usually basically price it without usage. So we do a really low day rate and just the production costs and then say like, there's no usage included, but if, you know, you want to use this on a billboard, it would be this much more. And it, you know, it's worth it to us to do it. Oftentimes we'll get stock asks. I think this happened recently, actually. We'll get stock asks where they'll say, oh, this, this artist does a lot of this type of work. Do you have stock that you can send us? And now of course, nothing's quite right. And we'll say, why don't we just shoot it in their studio? It, you know, the amount of time that we're searching through all of our files and you guys are trying to make it work, we can just shoot you something. And, it, it, you know, it won't be that much more expensive. Um, so, um, you know, I would say, and then there are times where for treatments, I've had a lot of artists do this. Um, they will shoot something for a treatment because they know um, and yeah, I'm thinking John Keatley and Mako Arceus have done it and it's totally got them the job because the client saw their campaign in the treatment and, you know, in Mako's case, I think it was to show a perspective and lighting with some miniatures that she wanted to show them how it would come out technically, you know, it, the producers and the creative team were so blown away that they went through that much effort and that much thought that, um, they knew that this artist was going to be collaborating hard uh, on this on this work and would would almost be another art director on the team. The the photographers that are doing really well these days are are also art directors, I think, in their bones. They all could be. Um, and they're, you know, sadly, people are so busy and in, in meetings all the time that they don't have time to do the fun, creative art direction part of their job a lot. They don't have time to like come up with ideas and, um, 
experiment. So if a photographer can supply them with ideas or um, supply them with visuals that will help sell a concept through to a client, that they're going to be favored. It makes a lot of sense. And also, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're going back to them saying, we can do this. Here's a reduced rate. Here's, you know, we can take care of it. Just there's no usage. Yeah. So it is at least they're not expecting you to pick up the check. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we Good. can. We can. Um, and we know that if they are going to pay for just the production costs or the assistant or whatever, that um, to them, it's worth something. You know, it, it's a serious thing that they're exploring. Yeah. I would say the hardest thing is when we go through the triple bid process and do all this work and do treatment work and everything. <laughs> they come back to us and say, oh, we actually found out the client doesn't want to do a shoot this year or they just want to do illustration. And we're like, why did you ask that? We did that. <laughs> where, where did that get lost in translation? <laughs> I mean, I have to think, and, and you know, I have to think that they're simultaneously exploring many avenues at once, but um, because it's our job to be really breezy and easy to work with, we're not telling people how hard it is what they're asking us to do. And I learned that lesson when I came from being a photo editor to an agent and I was doing editorial. I didn't realize the hardship that I was putting photographers through as a photo editor because every photographer was basically kissing my butt, but I didn't know it. I just <laughs> thought I was the cat's meow. I thought everybody wanted to go out for, you know, for drinks with me all the time in New York and LA because I was just such a wonderful person. <laughs> it wasn't until the day I became an agent that I realized nobody wanted to get drinks with me anywhere. <laughs> and that, um, that, you know, when I said, can you drive four hours away and do this? And also I have no budget for a second assistant or food. What a terrible position I was putting people in. Um, and, or I have this all in and it's just is what it is. I wasn't either old enough or experienced enough to do the math in my head and think realistically, what is that $1,000 budget? How is that going to be spent? Um, and because photographers, it's so competitive and photographers are so agreeable, I didn't know what I was putting them through. And when I did get attitude, I was turned off by it. And there were so many photographers that I was like, oh, I'll just choose somebody who's more cheerful. So uh, they were doing the right thing by not complaining to me, but it enabled a climate of really ab abuse. And I, I, I'm a part of that system now, you know, I'm, I'm a yes man, you know, I want to there's so many people out there. I want to give people what they need. I want to do it cheerfully. Um, but I, and, and oftentimes when like some, my fellow agents and I, we were like, Oh God, I can't believe they asked us to do this. I'm saying, or thinking to myself, they don't know what they're asking. They're not bad people. They just really don't know that you are canceling birthday parties, missing kids events, um, staying up until two in the morning to get this treatment to them. I have dipped my toe in explaining it to people nicely. Like, hey, you know, it's Memorial Day weekend and this is Friday and you're asking for a treatment on Tuesday. So uh, I just want to know if we are in the top one or two bidders before I put my artists through this. And if we're the triple bid, uh, I will respectfully bow out of this process. But it's a risk. Yeah. Because like you said, like if that one, even the trip of bit is the one time that might have pushed it over the edge. So skipping that one barbecue or, you know, you've got the house booked on the lake and everything. And the partner, unfortunately, is in the bedroom on their laptop pulling files. Right. And mom, not now. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, if, I, I so respect all of my artists for what they pull off. I mean... You know, you you had Gabriella Herman on here. I mean, she can, I've never seen somebody work the way she works. She can like pull a treatment together on an airplane on the way to another country and be cheerful about it. And she's not faking it. She just, it's, she's just efficient in that way. Um, and uh, I, I think in order, you know, part of it is why I'm, I'm not a photographer. I don't, I don't know that I could do that. I don't know that I could 
trash my schedule uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, I do it in my own way, but I know how to do it. Um, you know, I can do an estimate at you know, after the kids go to bed or whatever, if I need to. Um, but you have to really be in a creative space too, to make a treatment. You can't, it's not something you're not like putting numbers together. You're, you're really trying to think about it and, and have the writing be interesting and the words be interesting. It's, it's a different thing. So we'll see where it goes. Can you, first of all, people should still be asking you out. Photographers should still be asking you out to lunch because <laughs> I love the way you talk about photography. And if this is how you talk about all of your artists, like all the photographers should still be saying, hey, I'm in town. <laughs> no, photographers, I should, I should scratch that. Phot photographers do. Although I'm thinking specifically of photographers that already had agents and then I became an agent and I was no longer a photo editor. So there, I couldn't give them anything. Okay. Um, at, uh, and then now it's, it's just, I mean, you know, the people you really connect with, you know, the people you don't, it's a more realistic, I think being a small business owner, it's a, it's a more realistic view of the world. Um, being an art producer or photo editor, I think you could go through your whole life not knowing um, that, you know, people are catering to you all the time. Um, and it's a nice way to go through life. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, now I know the difference between the true true blues and, and the non-true blues um, out there. And I'm a little... I'm an innocent person by nature, but I would say I'm a little more shrewd about what people's <laughs> motivations are um, in engaging with me. Nice way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been so much fun. Um, oh, good. Yeah, no, it's super. There's so much information. I'm so thankful. Oh, just, why I, would I, you I, want to talk to an agent? He has all these creatives on here. <laughs> it's going to be like, wah, wah. Oh, no, this is great. No, it's it's inspiring. I I mean, you're obviously passionate about photography. And I think that's the thing that I mean, everybody was just connected on. It's just that we both love the visual arts. And so we can, you know, talk about it forever. Um, I do. I think we are almost, this has almost been an hour already. And I know you've got a few photographers that are probably wanting for you to get back to their decks. And I did have one last question. Can you give like an example or framework for like a photographer to like, um, what would be an imaginary assignment that they need to put a deck together for? Like a, a treatment. Um, what would be some of the questions that they need to answer successfully in that treatment? Well, there's usually an outline, like what I was saying, like applicable work, production team, casting, styling hair and makeup, wardrobe. So there are all those sections, um, but sometimes they're solving a problem. Um, you know, how are we going? We have six celebrities, but one of them can't show up to the shoot. How are we gonna incorporate them in this and have it look natural? So there's like a problem to be solved or um, we're showing this product, but only three of the products are physical products. The last one hasn't been made yet. Or we want to do this, you know, appliance commercial, but we want to do it in a way that no other appliance commercial has been done. What's your solve for that? Um, so there are, I mean, I always like it when there's something real to tackle. Um, and I always urge my artists to be specific about what they can do. Um, but that's also risky because if you're specific and it's not in the direction that they want, then you're specifically wrong. So <laughs> um, I, I think the solution for that is to maybe come up with three different ideas that could possibly work. And then people are like, oh no, what if they steal my ideas? They could, they could. So, you know, there's a little bit of faith, um, but we've got to put our best. It doesn't help to withhold in this industry or frankly in life. It just doesn't help. You're going to get hurt sometimes, but you got to just put it all out there every time or else you're going to wonder whether you, you know, would have gotten it or, or not. And I think that that is the perfect spot to uh, end on. Cause it's, it's so true. 
Um, is there anything else you would like to share? I don't want to cut you up. Is there anything else you want to uh, talk about? You've been amazing. This has been so good. Oh, good. I'm so happy to hear that. I can't think of anything. I mean, one of the questions that a lot of people ask is like, what should I be looking for in an agent? And um, I would just say to people that um, it really needs to be somebody, you know, that all of us who do what we're doing are hopefully pretty good at what we do and responsible and all of those things and know how to estimate. But, um, you know, like with anything, you have to not dread calling them. It has to be easy to pick up the phone. You have to trust that they speak about you in a way that you might be speaking about yourself, um, that you're not going to like cringe in the way they're talking about you or photography. So it's kind of the, um, uh, like the alchemy stuff, the sort of X factor stuff, like to, is, does this feel natural? Most of the artists we end up working with, we work with a little bit freelance and it's just like we back into it. It's like we never weren't working together. Like most good relationships, it's just so easy that it it's suddenly real. Um, so I would I would tell people when they're looking for different agents to, to just consider who they want to be on the phone with because we talk to all of our artists a lot, like sometimes every day. Nice. Um, and then, um, you know, the other thing, we've been doing a lot of um, uh, reviews uh, through Diversify Photo. And also we, you know, in 2020, we started giving out um, free reviews uh, to the um, BIPOC community. And um, I'm finding across the board a tentativeness in people putting themselves in their work that I think in an effort to be professional, they kind of hide who they are, which I understand that instinct, you know, there's like a little bit of imposter syndrome and like, I want to be really pro. So I'll make myself as a person invisible, but back to what I was saying before about your voice being so important. Now, um, the more of yourself you can put into it, there's so many different reasons that you get a job or an opportunity. And if the fact that you've been making homemade mochi since you were six, that seems to have nothing to do with anything is not mentioned <laughs> and there happens to be a huge campaign for some new mochi product product it would be such a shame if that was missed so i guess my point is whatever your passion is even if you don't have to be exhaustive but like even one sentence in your bio that says you know i've been playing the flute since i was five or you'd never expect that you know uh, i actually breed pugs or whatever it is I would say just put more of who you are um, in into your whole sort of branding package because it's being a good photographer is sort of like baseline, the expectation for every agent and client out there. It's all the other stuff that is going to like make these connections and, and give these opportunities to you. That makes so much sense. So Marin, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I had a, I just had a wonderful time. Uh, My this absolute conversation. pleasure. It's yeah. nice to meet another um, ex North Carolinian. Exactly. And I'm going to have to dig through my archives because I have some film from shooting inside that club. Um, Such a good club. Is it still there? I have no idea. I haven't been back in ages. We should um, have a reunion. That'd be fun. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you everybody for listening. Thank you, Marin. And I will be back in a uh, couple of weeks. We have the uh, executive director for Photographica uh, joining us. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Bye.